welcome everyone. Thank you to be here. Uh, actually, Christophe and I yeah, met at Park 21, an innovation camp um, that we co-organized. We can talk about it later after, during the Q&A session. Uh, and then we spent some time together uh, in Bali in uh, an amazing co-living space uh, run and founded by Bruno that is here with us. And uh, we also spent some time in Bali as well in February with Eric in a camp, um, a Copas camp. And uh, actually Copas... Basically we are only on holiday all the time. <laughs> yeah, th this is co-living and digital nomad, right? You, we don't work, we just travel, right? <laughs> Yeah, w you can confirm that later or not. Um, and uh, Eric uh, is the founder of uh, co-working space in Paris Mutinerie, as well as Copass, uh, which is a network of co-working spaces all around the world. You get a passport and you can work uh, everywhere. And he's regularly setting up retreats and camp all around the world. One of them coming soon with these guys here. And I'll let you introduce them. Yes, and also this, uh, uh, you wouldn't know, but this, this beautiful uh, young lady is not available anymore because she's in love with this guy and they do great business with each other. It's, <laughs> and it's Marcus and Philly and um, they are, for me, they are like, they introduced the concept or the idea of digital nomads to me when they came to Beta House three, four years ago or how much, and they, they are kind of, I would say they're curating a, a global community of digital nomads and do events and conferences about it, but maybe they can explain you a little more what they do. But before we do that, we want to know a little bit more about the audience, right? So we were thinking, let's start in the back, no, so simple question, who of you is familiar with the concept of digital nomadism? Okay, Ooh, there are hi. quite, thank you, there are quite some people who are probably not so much into it. You will learn a lot today. Um, and who of you already is considering himself being a digital nomad? Okay, good. Any other thing you want to know? Uh, maybe who runs a project around digital nomadism or co-working or co-living here? Okay, co-working, co-living, digital nomadism. Basically, you all have to co-sharing. <laughs> Everybody up? Okay. <laughs> and how many of you live location independently but hate the term digital nomad? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a nice way of running the panel, actually. We'll just ask you questions. No, we don't do that. Okay, so I think we are ready to uh, kick off our first uh, round. And this would be... You guys introducing yourself and telling us a little bit, um, one, two things about the passion you have for the project. And what, tell us what you do and tell us why you do it. And we start with a really beautiful blonde girl in the middle. Ah, okay. Yeah, my name is uh, Feli and I'm, as Christoph said already, together with Markus, the founder of the DNX. It's a digital nomad conference. And uh, we have an international conference. The last one was in Bangkok just a few months ago. And um, yeah, we are digital nomads ourselves and live location independent and work location independent. That means that we don't have a proper home anymore. We call our home base to be in Berlin, but we are not often there actually, <laughs> just a couple of weeks per year. So we also spend the winter now in um, South America and Southeast Asia and have also been, our last station was uh, Indonesia at Rome, at his co-working and co-living space there. It's really nice. Um, yeah, we really, really love the vibe of digital nomadism. So it's really to live um, a life of freedom and self-determination. So I really love that we, we are self-employed and can work on whatever we want and start new things and ideas whenever we want and to see a lot of the world and also change a lot of things. Um, so for me, it's really the perfect lifestyle. And I think you don't have to travel really fast like a backpacker. It's more that you live really in um, different countries for a longer time. And for us, as we travel since years now, we always come back to certain places. So it's not our first time in Bali or after Paris, we go to Tarifa. It's not our first time there. So we know where to go, where to live, where to work, uh, where to buy our stuff. So 
it's really a lot, uh, much different from a world trip. And many people think it's more like backpacking and just um, earn some money, but it's business first. And the second thing is to travel, yeah. But beside the conference, we also do co-working and co-living camps around the world. But so hi, I'm, uh, I'm Eric, so I'm the founder of Mutinerie and Mutinerie Village also, which is a co-working and co-living space in the countryside, one hour and a half from Paris, uh, and uh, from Copas. So Copas is a global network of co-working spaces, and basically you become a member of all spaces at once, instead of being just a member of one, one space. We've got 600 spaces, around 65 uh, countries, and what is funny is when I s really started the project, that what really turned me on was like, oh, actually, you could actually work from anywhere and, and have those co-working spaces as bases and be productive and meet people because like one of the first thing when you're traveling that might be hard is sometimes you're kind of alone. So when, you, when, you, when you've got a mate, that's, that's really great. But sometimes people are alone. And I think if you read forums, that's the main complaint we can hear. So for me, like co-working spaces were the perfect gateways to cities. And that's how I kind of uh, envisioned it. So I'm a weird digital nomad, I would say, because I've got a base here. And I did a calculation, and I, uh, last year I traveled 40% of the time. But in small trips, like I go for a week or for four or five days to different cities, whatever, whenever I've invited or to an event, I'm not staying for three days, but a week, or these kind of things. So I'm not the guy, like I, I stay for a shorter period of time, except when I travel far. So whenever I, I cross the notion, I usually stay for three weeks, one, one month. And uh, I think what's really interesting, and we'll probably discuss that, is that uh, you don't need to leave everything behind to become kind of a digital nomad. And that's why the, the actually the, the term is not very good, the name is not very good, because you can actually be a normal guy, even um, an employee, and two weeks per year, you go traveling. So. Here I am, happy to meet you guys. We always meet in different places, actually. <laughs> Never twice in the same. All right. Thank you, Eric. Hi, I'm Markus. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of DNX, um, which was Philly already talking about. And what really kicks me about the digital nomad lifestyle is, like now when it's raining, it's cold, I'm freezing, I can just leave this place and go to Tarifa or <laughs> go to Greece. <laughs> Right now, so we, we don't possess uh, many things or many clothes. I just travel with the carry-on. Uh, what I need is my iPhone and my MacBook and to work on all the stuff I want to work on. And this gives me the ultimate freedom. And traveling the world gives you, as a person, the, the bigger picture of what's really happening in the world and not the filtered stuff we get from our media. So you got the real picture of the world and most of the DJ nomads they are entrepreneurs, so they have entrepreneurial skills to start something, to change something. And this combined together is a big responsibility for us, and especially for the digital nomads, because the world is watching us at the moment. It's a big hype about this lifestyle. It gets more and more professional and sustainable. So it's very interesting to, to be at the peak and to live this lifestyle really to the edge. And very exciting times now, and I would like to invite every one of you to, to yeah, to consider um, becoming a digital nomad and to work from everywhere. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bruno, and I'm a digital <laughs> nomad. <laughs> Hello, audience. Um, I'm a rather a typical no digital nomad. Um, my story comes from a bottom-up and from a top-down approach. So um, I was kind of conservative in my 20s, so only starting in my early 30s. I never went backpacking. I never did interrail in Europe, for example. But then about five or six years ago, my profession got me from New York to San Francisco and Europe and going back and forth, and housing was always a problem. So we built a space in San Francisco that's called 20 Mission, which was very bottom-up driven. So we took over an old empty hotel, and it was people sharing this space and building it together. And that whole experience four years in then led me to why isn't there a place in more locations like those? And then we ended up in Bali, like so many other digital nomads, and started a company that basically takes existing real estate infrastructure and turns them into co-living spaces. So we started about three or four months ago in Bali, 
first co-living space, it has a communal kitchen, it has beautiful co-working space. And we're not necessarily for the first generation of digital nomads. It echoes a little bit what you guys said before. It's a lot of people who say, yeah, let's try this maybe for two months, or they come for a couple of weeks, and then they inquire about, how is Miami? Maybe I stay in Miami, which is our second location for two months. So it's the very early days of a bigger trend that's happening at the moment. And it takes some time to become a broader trend. So there's very few people who say, hey, I'm giving everything up and I'm going all in on becoming a digital nomad. And it actually becomes easier to do that. And the, th the second thing that you guys mentioned, which is also very true, a lot of people in our spaces, they work. There's very few people, except you and you so far. I think you were the only two. <laughs> Uh, who I see it as work. a vacation. <laughs> did you work? Yeah, I heard three, different three hours I wasn't day. there, but okay. <laughs> on average. But it's people who want to get stuff done. It's everything from the former marketing guy who thinks about, should I launch my own chocolate brand? And is Bali a good location to produce that? The writer who wants to finish his book or the child book illustrator. So it's a ton of different professions. It's not necessarily guys doing performance marketing or 24-year-old blockchain developers. It's actually a really broad spectrum of different professions and backgrounds. Uh, thank you for sharing this. Uh, I would like to react and to be maybe a little bit uh, provocative because you're all talking about, oh, we just need our iPhone, our MacBook, and we it's like this hype trend, and why do we call it digital nomads? Um, what do you see today uh, like in terms of a trend of bubble of digital nomadism. How d wh what do you have to say about it? Maybe Bruno or Feli, I see you reacting. <laughs> yeah, it's of course like the, the expert scene you formerly had. Um, they, yeah, if you stay longer in one place, it gets more and more normal and you also behave like you would behave at home in Paris. And so it can happen that you just have no other nomad friends and meet with them and um, yeah, don't really connect with the local culture and that's actually a pity because yeah, you're in a different country and that's one of the exciting things to experience this country and to see how the locals live and to exchange know-how with them and yeah, it can happen very easily so you should be aware of it and maybe do things against it. So, But many co-working spaces, for example, or yeah, co-living projects do... Um, events or things to um, to connect the groups better. So you are not a tourist, you are not a local, you are something in between. So yeah, it's just interesting to be aware of it. Yeah, I just want to underline that it's very important that you don't see this digital nomad concept as a one-way geo-arbitrage thing and to live in a cheap country somewhere in Thailand and just spend Thai baht and earn dollars and euros and go away from this country without leaving something there. You have so many skills and we have so much to share. We have so much knowledge that um, we encourage our people who come on our camps to go in the local schools to educate the kids and to, to give lectures and courses and, and talk to them how easy it is in nowadays to to get your word out, to start a YouTube channel, and we did this in Brazil, and I know about some initiatives on Bali or on uh, Koh Lanta, on Thailand. The co-working space Co-Hub is doing a lot with the local school. So things are changing at the moment, and I think this is very important to give something back. I fully agree, and I think the main driver behind those trends is actually technology. It's everybody is on Facebook. and. Despite Skype and other technologies being 10, 15 years old, so they're not necessarily new technologies, it takes some time for society to absorb that. But we see that in Indonesia, that everyone from the local chef to the local artist, they are all on Facebook, you end up all in the same groups, and that then helps them. There's this practical example of Ratri, I think you met her also, who's now in Berlin because of people who stayed at Rome and they knew about this art scholarship for the university in Berlin. So that's kind of the unifying factor. And I think that's also why there's this crappy joke about digital nomad. You are, when you have two MacBooks, you gotta have two that makes you a digital nomad. If you have only one, you're not a digital nomad. But it's more about technology enabling completely new forms of communication. And I think that's different. So to go back to your question of a bubble of like overhyped thing about uh, digital nomadism, I think the thing is, Digital nomadism is one of these concepts that I, I, I usually call uh, lifestyle porn. So it's something that a lot of people want to do but don't dare to do, you know. So, 
So basically, it, it, it brings a lot of attention compared that. to... <laughs> it really brings a lot of attention compared to its size. Like, people like to talk about this because it's a nice story, you know? You like to hear uh, about this guy that, you know, went around the world and worked from anywhere. And it's, I mean, it's like anyone that has, has a shitty job want to hear these kind of stories, basically. <laughs> So it drags a lot of attention. And then if you look at the size, and we all know each other, you know, that's a sign. <laughs> so so it's, it's still pretty small. But what I think is really interesting and when I, where I, what I think is not overhyped is how many people <laughs> are able, uh, will be able to do that. And not us, not, not us like full time or leaving everything behind or with a backpack, but the number of people that will do that like, for some time in the year, this is really big because what like what prevents an employee in a in a company to just go there with his team and work from I don't know Bali or Thailand or whatsoever for for a month? Actually, it's, it probably will become some kind of seminars that they are doing, you know, some kind of way to attract talents to your companies, and this is going to be a big stuff. And probably it won't even come from freelancers. Probably like the big thing will come from even employee, employees in big companies. And I think this is not overripe, but the, the, the whole character of the guy on the road, this is probably a bit overripe. Yes, yeah, so when I fir first heard about this topic, digital nomadism, I usually saw these lonely wolves with a backpack traveling the world, you know, wanting to leave everything behind. Maybe they were disappointed from their lives. And now it's becoming more normal. And After a breakup, so many. <laughs> yeah, myself. <laughs> and what? Yeah, myself. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so the, the question, but, but now it's becoming more, like, more mainstream, I feel. Even, even <laughs> I am doing it now. So, <laughs> so uh, the question is, there are two things. One, pre one stereotype I had is, it's only for rich people. I, I'm sorry if I look at the pricing of, of Rome. It's like fucking expensive. And, um, and also it's nothing, or I'm asked many times, what about families? Um, is it just a lifestyle for a certain type or profile or is it something that is really becoming mainstream and get, can be for everybody? And I wanted to ask you what you think about it. Maybe I start with that. It's definitely getting broader. So uh, we look at not only the 27-year-old freelancer, which is kind of Tim Ferriss, cargo pants, cult, or part of that, it's the couple in the late 30s who say, hey, let's downsize, let's shift our priorities. Um, also, early empty nesters who said, hey, the kids are in college, let's finally travel the world. The reason uh, we are more expensive is it's because in the very early stages of coal living, to get a little bit away from uh, digital nomadism, more towards coal living, is there's very little dedicated infrastructure. So you, what you often see is kind of this uh, uh, function of Piketty complete reserve currency cities that are very unequal, like San Francisco and New York, where coal living isn't a better option. It's uh. <coughs> where coal living is actually something that's the only way for a lot of people to live in those cities and afford them. Uh, so that's only slowly developing. So when we go out there, we literally have to rent whole hotels. Two or three years from now, we will see more infrastructure that has much, much better price points. But that's only something that's developing at the moment. But at the same time, it's for a really broad audience. There's kind of, again, it's the first generation is this, I have my backpack and I piece everything together myself and uh, I stay in a homestay for 15 bucks. But now there are people who are saying, hey, I'm a well-off freelancer that makes 80, 100K in a city like London, New York, San Francisco, just the opportunity cost of having a failed Airbnb experience is not worth my money. That's why I'm looking for a provider that gives me a more turnkey solution. So it's coming from both sides. It's more and more people getting interested in a lifestyle and also from the other side, not only us, but people like outside and so on, <coughs> providing more and more products that are easily accessible at a high, pri high price point at the moment, but Fortunately, or hopefully, this will come down significantly over the next couple of years. So it's like the iPhone, maybe. First, very expensive, and then for everybody. Or Tesla or Uber, to use all the crabby metaphors you have in pitch meetings, yes. 
Yeah, for us as long-term nomads, it's actually not more expensive to travel because we cut down our costs in Germany, so we don't pay double and um, many people just get it wrong. Of course, life in Brazil is more expensive than in Thailand, for example, but um, if you count it all together, it's the same we would spend in Berlin. But of course, you have to cancel your contract, you care that you don't pay your mobile phone thing, and because you pay it in another country then. And for your second question with the families, um, that's always the concern or question <laughs> of everyone. So, um, I, yeah. <laughs> Um, in, in Germany, yeah, in Germany you have to uh, s bring your kids to school by law. So you have maybe six years where you could travel. You travel most of the time slower than other people. But um, yeah, we even know a lot of um, families. They are also a community. They, do, uh, they are not registered in Germany anymore. And then they can do homeschooling or even the new trend is unschooling. So um, there are really families doing that and they exchange their know-how and yeah, it's interesting um, to find more about. Let me be quickly extend that question because <laughs> um, looking at you two guys, uh, honest answer. So you would, not knowing the life of a digital nomad, would you uh, consider if you had kids yourself to just go on that way or what are your thoughts about it? Um, we think w maybe we would learn um, more about, we would speak to other families who are doing the homeschooling or unschooling to see if it's a possibility. Or otherwise, maybe we did it now for years and then we have another six years and maybe we don't want to do it anymore then if we decide for kids. So I think it's not a problem. Uh. Actually, again, it's a question of, of profile because um, I w I, especially for camps, I was thinking of doing that with, with the COPAS camps is to um, do a camp during, uh, during school holidays. So you can tell to people, bring your kids with you. Because if, if you, don't, you don't have any holidays left, just you don't care. You can work from another location, and then you organize stuff for the kids. So actually, it can be the option to actually spend all the school holidays with your kids in a nice location while still working. And I think this is very interesting. It's, it's not done yet and it's it's true that it's a lot of logistic and and also the business mod model of those camps is, is not is pretty fragile i think it's not we don't make a lot of money doing camps to be very fair uh so there's maybe something to figure out but i think actually being being mobile can be a very very good opportunity when you've got kids it just depends on the way you you travel and probably you're gonna maybe you'll do that even if you school your kids every holiday you just go and go back to your digital nomad life which is pretty cool and I think the main point is just that you have more freedom. So you can also be the father that is there to pick his kid up from the school and other parents can't because they can't, um, yeah, because they have to work in a company nine to five. And also more intimacy as a family. So you can spend more intense quality time together. And there's also some interesting experiments. I don't know when you were in Bali, did you meet Elena Tubut? she leads a group of single moms that travel together as digital nomads. So they work from anywhere. It's a group between seven and 12 people, depending on the size, and they're traveling for two and a half years, and they share all the logistics, and everybody is, one of the people is on child duty each day, so they share all that responsibility. So we are seeing a lot of experiments around that infrastructure as well. So once you become location independent, uh, it's very interesting, and can I live a better family life, maybe even for a couple of years? Yeah. I think there is only one other thing that is important. Is it, it, I think for me it's perfectly okay that being a digital nomad is just for a certain period in your life. You know, it, it doesn't, I mean, it's not like, ah, I gotta make the switch and now I've got to become it for my whole life. I mean, it's, I think it's perfectly okay. I mean, we, y like you've been on Erasmus and you've been living everywhere during your studies and then you sometimes you go back to your uh, more normal life and, and that's okay. I think that's... Uh, uh, I, th I think there will be different types of people, and probably the, the typical, like typical scheme would be the guy. He has been on Erasmus. He likes to travel. He's still kind of single, or he went through a breakup after school because they went in different cities, and then he starts. <laughs> because honestly, during the DNX, they ask how many people are single. I think it was like 80% of the of the people. It was it was crazy. 
Yeah, it's getting better. It's getting better. <laughs> you too are. <laughs> Me too, actually. And um, and uh, yes, so so probably you're gonna go and for one year and a half, two years, three years, you're gonna travel and you're gonna come back. Maybe you're gonna have kids and then you're gonna just travel during holiday. And maybe your kids leave and then you go back to digital nomad. That's perfectly okay. That's not like it's not a permanent state. It it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I think this is an important point. What many people don't get, especially I think the journalists in Germany, they always ask us, "How so? You are digital nomad now, and uh, how long do you want to do it? And uh, for the rest of the life, you're digital nomad, right? And you could never can come back and have a flat." And I say, "No, man. It's it's very easy to just rent a flat <laughs> and, and to yeah to put my my stuff again in a in a house and maybe to get some kids and raise them wherever we want." So. It's not about a state you have forever. It, I think it just gives you, for a certain amount of time, the ultimate freedom to choose whatever you want to do with the freedom. It's not about traveling very quickly and to rush some bucket lists and um, to check in everywhere you wanted to go and see the world. It's not a world trip. It's more about having more freedom, whatever you want to do with it. Picking up your, your kid from school, Pat Flynn from the US is a good example. He's the only father who picks up his kid every day from school and the rest can't do it. Or go after your hobby you always wanted to do or learn to, to play an instrument and to, to learn some new sports. So whatever you want to do gives you more freedom to be location independent. Um, okay, thank you. Um, we're like soon to... Do you want to react? No. Um, we're going to give you uh, the, the mic to the audience soon, but just before um, closing this panel and giving the, um, giving the mic uh, to you guys, I just wanted to know, because we've been talking about uh, all the crazy cool stuff and opportunities and so on, just a quick word, uh, each one of you, about the like, biggest challenge that you had to face uh, through your journey as a digital nomad. A quick anecdote. Yeah, f for me, I would say it's just like pro probably it's friends and friends and families. I, would, I mean, that's the thing that uh, you're always happy to find back when you when you come back to your home city, like very very quickly. I would say that, and sometimes logistic, but it's part of the game and it's it's fun also. Sometimes. Yeah, for us it was at a certain point to get some routines and structures on the road, be because when you have such an unstable life and always have new impressions and meet new people and have new environments and new setups it's it's very unstable so you need some some structure some routines i i wake up every day with the sunrise which is a routine for me then i do meditation i do a seven minute app stretching routine i do my five minute journal which is a gratitude journal so to get into a certain mood and then i i knock off the most important tasks or eat the frog thing in the very morning in the very beginning of the morning um And this is the point where you get at a certain point, especially as, as um, an entrepreneur. But I think, especially in the beginning, it's very normal and very cool just to try whatever you wanted to try before. But then at a certain point, you, you need to be more structured on the road. Um, I would add some organizatorial things, like in your home country with your flat. And um, yeah, if you leave your flat, you cannot have a company or the insurance thing. And there are some um, obstacles because there are no proper rules for us yet. It's getting better and sometimes you find some workarounds that are still legal, but it's not perfect and a hassle. Um, making sure that I have my shit together regarding the different storage boxes that I've rented all over the world. <laughs> But otherwise, it's... Uh, um, can I do a shameless plug? It, it was Before that, it was really reliable housing to, to find a place where uh, I feel good, can be productive, and at the same time also get to know people fast. And that's pretty much the main motivation why we did Roam, that we can actually create this infrastructure. Well, I actually was listening and I, I kind of know those two guys a little more and we also shared flat for a while and I am totally um, astonished by the structure you have, uh, waking up in the morning. When I'm now, I'm in Paris, I have an, a meeting at five o'clock, I totally forget about it because I'm lying in the sun at the canal. So if, when I travel, I always think I'm out of duty. 
and I really have to change my mindset if I actually work and travel. And this is a hard thing uh, for me. At home means structure, and traveling means like do whatever I want. So, uh, and actually, it annoys me to 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 kind of have to structure while I'm traveling, because it's my holiday, you know. But it's not. <laughs> oh man, now I'm even more confused than before this panel. <laughs> okay, time for questions. Yeah. Um, okay, what do we have? Here's a question, there's a question, there's a question over there. Okay, we start here. Cool. So, um, my question is um, when it comes to sort of like legal and tax uh, issues, like digital nomads are in a little bit of a gray area. Um, in like. W is it usually is it usually the case that you find people tend to register themselves as self-employed in their home countries? At least that's sort of what I've come across. Or they eventually set up their own entities in more tax-favorable countries. That's that's one. Sorry, that, it's like several questions rolled into one. If that's okay. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Actually, the, the the thing that interests me the most, right, is so f say for example, take a country like Thailand. It's very favorable for nomads. It's like super fucking cheap over there. Uh, great quality of life and all that sort of thing. But at some point, the government is probably going to crack down on nomads. At least that's my feeling. And I wonder, when is that going to happen? And if it happens, is that not a big risk for business models like yours, where you have these sort of like co-living working houses? All of a sudden, you have you know the military or the police turn up, and they're like, round everyone off and put them in the, you know, in the, in the clink. So... Please try to make it a simple and short answer because there are more questions. Okay. No, I was. Um, most Southeast Asian countries and all countries all over the world are actually quite happy to have digital nomads uh, for various reasons. Uh, the way you solve it, it's a little bit nation states also start to dissolve from the other side. So you have countries like Estonia and so on that make it very easy for you to register and at the same time countries in Southeast Asia are actually happy to have you because at least you buy a couple of coffees or drinks and at least they get some tax off that basis. If you stay in a country for longer than half of the year, you have to register. So the existing laws that you have to make sure that you take care of, but if you're truly location independent, which most people are, so you spend less than half of the year in a specific country, you can pretty much choose. And that's something countries also start to wake up uh, to it. Estonia is one of the first, but we also see already countries in Southeast Asia that just start thinking about separate visa categories and tax categories exactly for that use case. Yeah, I wanted to add uh, Thailand is even thinking about a five-year visa for nomads or entrepreneurs. So because you don't take the jobs of the locals, so if someone is working at a dive master or in a language school, it's different. But nomads usually earn maybe money from companies in Germany or the US, so they don't compete and they bring money into the country. So they actually love nomads in case of Thailand. It's different for other. And yeah, uh, most of the nomads either they are registered in their home country or elsewhere, like in Hong Kong, Delaware, or there are some moments they are registered nowhere. It's a bit complicated, but um, yeah. I think everybody has to, to um, value for themselves which risk they want to go. Um, for instance, in Germany, the tax laws are very hard and very rushed. So if we would go away and register our, our company in Hong Kong or um, on the Virgin Islands, and whenever we come back to Germany, want to register again, we have to pay lots of taxes again to just to get the status again. So we have a company in Germany. We we pay full taxes in Germany, even though we are just some weeks of the year in Germany. So everybody has to consider for themselves what they do. But yeah, it's an interesting topic. Okay. So what we do next is when you ask a question, you uh, you name the person you want to answer from, and only one is answering. <laughs> and so you were about to ask. Yes, please. Well, maybe whoever feels inclined to answer this first, but I think it's interesting that each of you named uh, some risk of uh, loneliness when traveling and being a digital nomad. And I was curious what your respective approaches are to creating some consistency of culture or community in your spaces and how they might differ as well. So I'm not sure if that applies to, uh, okay. to your guidance. I have the mic. I have the mic. So yeah, loneliness is a big challenge and it's a big topic in our um, in our community. And as uh, Eric just mentioned, we have lots of singers traveling the world because they are very freedom related and they don't they want to don't want to many people don't want to have stable relationships, especially the generation Y. It's, it's a hard uh, topic for them, but it's getting better and better as the community grows and as there are more platforms. 
um, like the DNX conferences, the DNX events, the co-working camps, more people coming together and their magic happens. We know about many things which happens on our after show parties and so people get connected now. <laughs> Can I add something? <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> yeah, and of course, if you travel alone, you should go to hotspots where are for sure other nomads and not in a small fisher village where no one else is. And if you know those hotspots, yeah, it's no problem to meet others. Or you go to a co-living space. Um, so uh, you live together with those in the same house. Sure, okay. sure. Are you yeah. still want to answer ask the question? Just three okay. words. Bruno, what's next? <laughs> Tonight or in terms of cities? There was a question in the back, actually. Yeah. Uh, finding more places, having a denser network. So eventually we want to get to a place where in a city like New York we have multiple locations. So you can say, hey, I feel a little bit artsy and I want to save on rent, so I'm moving to Bushwick. Or then I have this job in Midtown for the next six weeks. I want to be close to my office. So more locations, more diverse locations as well. More. Oh, there. And there. Hi. Um, do you think uh, with the sort of the digital nomad at the moment is very much a kind of thing driven by obviously digital things, digital companies, but do you not think with like blockchain and people's more and more desire to get away from the system, away from the current structure, I think it's more than that is going to drive the growth in that kind of nomadic lifestyle going forward. Not that we're all going to live kind of like off grid, but I think more and more people are desiring to escape the current operating system in the world and lots of countries like Estonia and others will start to make it easier for people to do that. Yeah, that's totally correct. <laughs> what we see is that there are more and more rural communities um, just created by digital nomads who can settle down wherever they want and they start to blockchain and de de um, connect from the, from the system. And there are many interesting pro projects going on, especially on Greece at the moment, um, where we want to join in the next weeks for especially this project. So people are looking, they want to escape the cities, they want to escape the, I don't know, the, the stress and the rush in the cities. And especially digital nomads can play a big part and take a big role in this movement. Um, I think you should never be critical of the audience, but I think also in digital nomadism, it's mostly social and cultural problems. So I'm not yet too sure how a blockchain would solve that. So what's often in co-living, you have this abstract Silicon Valley thinking of, oh, why don't we just build a city somewhere in the desert? And I think before we get to these more digital autonomous systems, uh, we have to figure out the social dynamics behind it and what that means. And that it's complicated. It has a history. It has a cultural and social context. And I think those are the more important topics than how can we abstract away that uh, you get your ID or your tax number. Um, for me, I kind of feel like and when it comes to digital nomadism, it's a lot about pitching and it's very like, yeah, I traveled so far and this is what I do. And it's, it's almost like a dichotomy for me to like the more sharing and collaborative community. And I wonder how you guys see if there an overlap or what, you, what trends you see or what your perception is, whoever feels inclined to answer. Um, what do you mean exactly? Like the fact that uh, <coughs> Like they are mostly individualistic or something. This is I feel like it's very competitive rather than ra rather than really like helping each other or like. Oh no 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 really not. I mean, if you go to their camps, for instance, or even Copas camps, or if you come to the camp we do in Greece on the 16th of June all together, um, you'll see. I mean, like they they have especially you. You do a lot of that, like lots of workshops and and people exchanging what their problems are, and then the other okay spend like the next day. Uh, with the guy to try to help them, and then you also did the, the like you give them your to do list, and then the other checks on you if you actually did what you what you wanted to do. Uh, yeah, I think you did that. No, it's very actually it's uh, it's pretty much the the opposite because you're you're alone. So if you start you know bat battling the others, that sucks. What? Which, uh, which one? Which one? <laughs> yeah. As <laughs> And as um, most of the nomads have projects that you can run online, so it's really important to share pro projects of others to get a bigger reach and help each other. So it's very sharing the home, whole community. 
And um, talking from me, I come from the online marketing scene or world in Germany and was not very collaborative and everybody was very like, uh, I have my own agency, yeah, you can buy my knowledge, but I won't share anything. And this is what really kicks me in the digital nomad scene because it's so new and everybody is so excited, maybe a little bit too overexcited. Um, people are sharing and very supportive and where can I help you? And uh, most of the times when people come on our conference and they come from small, smaller cities, they meet for the first time in their life like-minded people who give you a high five when they talk about their ideas and so there's a very magical vibe on our conferences and not it's not very competitive at all yes um, we are out of time there is an African saying uh, if you want to travel fast travel alone and if you want to travel far travel together it's a, isn't it a nice ending <laughs>